Good morning. Again, it's a privilege and an honor to be invited to speak here this morning. The title of our message is Hate, Hope, and Hallelujah. Interesting title for a Valentine's Day message. We'll have to see where the Lord takes us today. The scripture verse and our focus will be Psalm 139, verse 21. Let me share that with you this morning. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? An extremely challenging question by the psalmist to God. I think it's a question that perhaps some of us have even raised with God over the past year. We know that all things are created by God with purpose and all things were created by God for good, amen? amen. So that, that means everything, including hate, was originally created for good and not evil. That seems like a contradiction in our world today for that means that there exists a godly hate and hatred at the same time a human hate and hatred. So let's first examine the better known evil side of human hate and hatred. Human hate and hatred is a component of sin that oftentimes is overlooked, yet present and working within the world today very powerfully. First John chapter three, verse 15, John declared, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Human hate is at the core of human hatred. It is the breeding ground of evil and wicked desires and thoughts that if unchecked, grows into hatred. So human hatred serves as a catalyst, producing a reaction of unrighteous thoughts and actions, all contrary to the word and the will of God. And we call that sin. James 1, 14 and 15 tells us, but each one is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire when conceived gives birth to sin, and when sin becomes full grown, it brings forth death. Satan's hate of God and desiring to be God resulted in his actions of disobedience. From the rebellion he led in heaven to the temptation of Adam and Eve to the present day, Satan's goal and desire remains to destroy all that God created for good by making it evil. Human hate and hatred are effective tools at creating anger and prejudice and violence and division to achieve those objectives. The hatred that comes forth from the ungodly, the unbeliever, is unrighteous, meaning not right. Every thought and action that is taken in an unright state will be in contradiction to God's word because it's motivated not by the spirit of God, but by the spirit of disobedience by the anti or against God or the spirit of antichrist. In the past year, we have seen the level of human hate rise across our land, resulting in violence, corruption, division, and injustice. And in the past weeks, it has increased dramatically, intensifying fear. And by the way, fear is a tool of tyrants and dictators, creating stress, anxiety, and worry in our nation, our communities, and even in our individual lives taunting us to react rather than act, challenging us in our faith and our walk with Christ to do what Christ would do while at the same time tempting us to revive the nature of the sinful man or woman we once were. Our nation is clearly not being united. We are being divided. Forget the parties, forget the causes, forget the issues, forget the personalities. In the end, you are either for God or against God. And everything you say and do and support will either line up with God's word or against it. In stark contrast, godly hate and hatred produces righteousness, righteous thoughts and actions in obedience to God's word. Today, we're going to examine this issue of hate for the believer to see how hate supports hope and can help us to proclaim hallelujah no matter what comes our way. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we just pray now that you'll put a hedge of protection about this place, that all disturbances and distractions will be removed and that our hearts and minds will be focused on hearing your word this morning. Anoint this vessel to bring forth your word. And Father, we'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, the praise in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. The worldly definition of hate and hatred is this, to have a strong dislike or ill will for to wish to avoid, to shrink from. Hate implies a feeling of great dislike or aversion with persons or an object, bearing malice against them or it. Other words used to accent hate include detest, which implies to vermintly dislike, 
or to despise suggests looking down with great contempt upon the person. To abhor implies a feeling of great repugnance or disgust, and loathe implies utter abhorrence. Now allow me to rephrase this definition with a biblical perspective. Godly hate and hatred means to loathe, detest, abhor, despise, to have a strong dislike for, and to wish to avoid, but as a believer in Jesus Christ, choosing not to avoid or to retreat from when confronted by it. Godly hate is to be directed towards the sin, the practice, not the sinner, neither bearing malice toward the person nor looking down on them, but instead showing them the mercy and the grace and the love that God has shown you never forgetting that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for each of us. The quote-unquote politically correct movement in our society today actually desires to remove the word hate from usage altogether. The word hate is being removed from written works and being discouraged and referring to actions taken by others that may disagree with them. Yet it is still used to describe quote-unquote hate crimes by the same group who wish to remove its use in contradiction to what they propose. In education, students have been taught to conform for the sake of uniformity, to surrender free thought as individuals for the sake of the group. Students have been educated to tolerate everything, except what they are told is not to be tolerated, making them very confused and very intolerant as adults. The question, who is going to tell them what's right and wrong? Parents, unfortunately for the most part, have surrendered that privilege and turned it over to a state run educational system where students have more power over choices than the parents. What is wrong has become right and what is right has become wrong in our society. And our universities are training camps for the indoctrination in this ideology. We have become as it was in the days of Noah. There is even an open movement to rewrite the word of God, making it quote unquote politically correct. And one of the words being targeted for removal is the word hate. Let me remind everyone what Deuteronomy 4.2 tells us. You shall not add to the word which I am commanding you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. In the last years of my teaching career, my students actually gasped when I told them it was okay to hate. I told them that I hate broccoli, and I do. I hate the smell of it, I hate the taste of it. But I told them I do not force you to believe the same as I do. But if I ever did, and I required you to, I would be breaking your rights. For if you take my right or anyone's right away to express themselves, even if you disagree, detest, loathe, despise, and dare I say, hate what I say or do, be prepared to have your freedoms and rights taken away by others. For the believer, it's important for us to have clarity and direction on the issue of hate and hatred. Psalm 119, 104 reminds us that from your precepts, your word, I get understanding. The Bible provides us with all those answers. So the question, does God hate? And if yes, then what does God hate? And we find the answers to both these questions clearly presented in Proverbs 6, 16 through 19, where we read the following. There are six things which the Lord hates. Yes, seven, which are an abomination to him. Verse 17, Haunty eyes, that would be lust of the eyes. A lying tongue, a liar. The hands that shed innocent blood. Hands that destroy innocent lives for personal gain, pleasure, or power. Verse 18, a heart that devises wicked plans. That's premeditated acts of evil. Feet that run rapidly to evil. Those who forsake truth with excuses and choose evil over good. Remember, God always gives us a choice and he will always make a way of escaping sin. Verse 19, a false witness who utter lies. You're not only a liar, but you graduated here with a double degree in false witnessing. And then finally, and one who spreads strife among the brothers. That would be one who looks to create division and disunity by destroying credibility and character, no matter what it takes, through a false witness combining all of the above. Proverbs 8.13 goes on to say, Fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way, and the perverted mouth I hate, saith the Lord. So it's clear that God hates, and as believers, we are also, it should also, hate what God hates. Psalm 97 verse 10 says, Hate evil, 
you who love the Lord, who preserves the soul of his godly ones, he delivers them from the hand of the wicked. As believers in Jesus Christ, Hebrews 1.9 declares to us, you have loved righteousness, what is right, and hated lawlessness, what is wrong. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above all your companions. That oil of gladness should be overflowing and should bring forth praises and worship to God continually. We should be rejoicing in knowing Jesus Christ and having him as our Lord and Savior. But are we? What God hates along with how God deals with hate then becomes the basis for what the world hates Jesus for. John 7 verse 7 says, Jesus said, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds are evil. John 15, 24 and 25, Jesus goes on to say, if I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word that is written in their law. They hated me without cause. The world hated Jesus without cause. He came in peace to seek and to save the lost. Yet even to this day, the world hates him because he told the truth and presented the righteousness of God. Man fears the truth because it exposes his evil and his sinful nature. Throughout history, the messengers of God's righteousness have been the focus of the anger expressed by human hatred. They are a physical reminder of truth, of what is right. Thus, they become the target of every kind of slander, lie, and physical threat. Political and religious leaders then use the mob and call it, quote, the will of the people to further their cause or lust for power. But like the lyrics of a song sung earlier at the beginning of the service, you can bury the workmen, but the work still goes on. Throughout history, they have killed the messenger, believing it will destroy the message, but instead it causes the message to become stronger and more real, a greater testimony of who Jesus Christ is. And for the men and women who were martyred, who died the horrible deaths for Christ, went there proclaiming the truth, went praising God, and even sharing who Jesus was with those who were going to execute them. Listen, you can't destroy what people believe in their heart by destroying them physically. Our own American Revolution proved that point. In every tangible area, men, ships, money, Great Britain had an overwhelming advantage. And it should have been a short conflict, a short conflict with Great Britain, the victorious winner in the end. But instead, it's a war lasting seven years. And for the first time in history, a group of citizens won their independence and right to create a nation under God, a republic with liberty and justice for all. And why? Because you cannot destroy an ideal or a belief by destroying people, occupying cities, or through executive decrees by authorities who have usurped the power of the people against their will. You can't change the way people think until there is a change in their heart. And how is the heart changed? Well, humans' attempts to suppress the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ have never succeeded and never will. The communists in China since the 1950s have tried to destroy Christianity through re-education, persecution, indoctrination, but today the Chinese Christian church continues to be the fastest growing church in the world. Before any education of the brain can take place, there must be be a changing of the heart. Before any education can properly begin, the heart, not the head, must experience an awakening to the truth, and that can only occur by the power of God's Holy Spirit. So many of you have shared with me, and others have, about their desire to see loved ones saved. It's a sincere desire from the heart. And at the end of each of those conversations, I say three things. First, continue to live for Christ, your testimony is good before them. Secondly, listen and share the gospel when God gives you a chance to share, share the scriptures with them. This is good too. But the greatest thing that you can do is go to your knees before God the Father each day crying out for them, pleading before the throne of grace for their soul to be saved. Because it's not by might, it's not by power. It's by the spirit of the Lord of hosts that things are done, Zechariah 4, 6. Andrew Murray, a pastor, Christian missionary and author, wrote the following, 
No knowledge of the air or the food around me can nourish me, except it enters into my inward life. And no knowledge of the truths can profit me, except as he, by the Spirit, enters into my inmost being and dwells within me. It is with the heart I must wait upon God. It is into the heart God will give his spirit and every spiritual blessing in Christ. And this is why the world then hates us. Because we have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. Our sins have been forgiven and the Holy Spirit has come to dwell within our hearts where we can proclaim with joy and truth that Jesus Christ is Lord. John 15, 18 through 19, Jesus declared, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. And oh, how we know that. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world. Because of this, the world hates you. Remember, Jesus chose each of you before we chose him. Luke 21, verse 17, and you will be hated by all because of my name. And then he gives this word of encouragement. Yet not a hair of your head will perish. That doesn't mean it won't grow white, it won't fall out. But verse 19 says, by your endurance, you will gain your lives by perseverance. The world hates us for the same reasons they hated Jesus, because we bring the message of righteousness and truth. John 3, verse 19 through 21, this is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. And everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. The Holy Spirit illuminates the sin, revealing it for all to see, calling out corrupt leadership, confronting evil with the truth, incurring persecution with no justification. Those that deny God or reject his word condemn themselves by their actions and words, but their evil actions and their words help to open the eyes and the ears to many to the truth that they need to hear. Remember, in the, it is darkest before the sunrise, and the light has the greatest illumination when it pierces into the darkest of places, driving away the darkness and revealing the truth. Those who love evil, they hate the light because it speaks of truth. Mark 13, 13 declares, you will be hated by all because of my name. That name that's above all names, the only name by which we can be saved, the name of Jesus Christ. Should we be surprised at this? The Bible says no. 1 John 3, 13 declares, do not be surprised, brethren, if the world hates you. Jesus taught and warned us of what was going to occur in the Beatitudes, but not without encouraging us to strive for the blessing, that through godly hatred of what God hates, we may gain hope. Matthew 5, verse 10 through 12 declares, Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. Jesus told us that we would be persecuted for doing right, insulted, falsely accused, and lied about. But we are called blessed by the Creator for our obedience to do His will. It's hard. It's hard to hate one who loves and heals, provides and shows kindness and mercy, who offers eternal life to you, who died for you. And in the face of such truth, the excuses used by those to commit evil are then blown away, revealing the true heart of a person and awakening the hearts of man to turn to the truth that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one will come to the Father except by him. Therefore, embrace ridicule, the lies, persecution, the hardship by unbelievers, in the hope of the opportunity to share God's love, mercy, and grace towards them, that they may decide to accept, believe, and confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. Jesus desired that none would perish, no, not even one. Psalm 38, verse 19 and 20 declare, My enemies are vigorous and strong, and many are those who hate me wrongfully, and those who repay evil for good. They oppose me because I follow what is good. And that brings us 
to our scripture verse this morning. But the psalmist questioned in verse 139, 21. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? The psalmist answers his own question in verse 22 with the response, I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. It's a good question in verse 21, but the response is not from God in verse 22. It is justifying human hatred. I hate my enemies. Our response as a Christian, a follower of Christ, must always be God's response. Jesus was speaking directly to this passage, correcting the misinterpretation found throughout the Old Testament when he states in Matthew 5, 43 and 44, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Hate the sin, love the sinner. Now this personally for me, and I think for many hearing this message this morning, can be a very hard thing to do. You're asking me to love my, your enemies, pray for those who persecute me. Add to this, Luke 6, 27, when the Lord said, but I say to you, but here, love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. Add to that 1 Peter 3, 8, do not return evil for evil or insult for insult. Now, wait a second. I don't want to hear any more of this. I don't want to hear more of this because what I hear coming from the hearts of men and even in some cases by believers is let's grab our torches and pitchforks, tar and feather, and go out and do some damage out there. But listen what Proverbs 29, 10 tells us. Men of bloodshed hate the blameless, but the upright are concerned for his life. Are you concerned with bloodshed or life? Whose life? Talking here about those who desire bloodshed, they're the ones we should be concerned with. Because lest we allow human hate to rise up and create human anger in us. And James 1, 19 and 20 tells us, let every man be quick to listen, slow to speak and slow in anger, because the anger of a man does not work the righteousness of God. Yet, doesn't God get angry? God gets very angry. But the anger of God is a righteous anger because he is God without sin and always right. God's anger is directed at correcting, reproving, and saving the sinner, the person. At the same time, God's anger is also directed at destroying sin and establishing what is just and right for his creation. God's anger should become our anger, which is then transformed into a passion when we love the Lord God with all our heart and all our soul and all our mind, loving our enemies, praying for those who persecute us, that hate us with the worldly hate, who call us their enemies, to love them, to pray for them, doing good for those who detest, loathe, and yes, hate us. Right now, imagine the face or the name of someone who simply gets under your skin that you could say, I hate. I hate being around them. I hate listening to them. I hate having anything to do with them. It could be someone you work with. It could be your boss. It could be someone in your family. It could be your husband or wife. It could be your children. It could be someone in the fellowship. If it is, I pray that you straighten that out quickly so there's no division. It could be a face of a politician. Now, are those people first on your prayer list? Do they even appear on your prayer list? This is liberating. When I started to pray for those names and faces that came up before me, God just lifted a burden, a burden that I think many of us are feeling during this time, to pray for them to seek the opportunity to share with the lost, to give God's offer of mercy and grace, the free gift of life through his son, Jesus Christ. For if sin does not destroy a life on earth, the sin will sentence that life to eternity in hell once it dies the physical death. Charles Spurgeon said this quote, you may think you can live fine without Christ, but you can't afford to die without him. Thus, our struggle, our journey to the cross and into a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ, must involve the adversity while we remain in this world of flesh. James 1 verse 2 says, we are to count it all joy when we encounter various trials. 
For the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have a full effect that you might be found perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Building our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Building a righteous hate of what God hates, and in turn, building our hope in Him who died for us. How does hating and hate Hating what God hates build my hope in God? When we stand for what is right, hating what God hates is evil, we stand with confidence because we know it is the truth and that truth will set us free. Free to stand with the assurance and on God's promises that build hope. Hope not in ourself or self-righteousness, but in God's righteousness alone. Free from the guilt of lying, free from the condemnation that others may attempt to place on us, free from the burden of doing what is wrong, knowing you're right because you're doing what is right in the eyes of God, your creator, strengthening your personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ and establishing integrity in you as a believer and in your relationship with others. I would encourage you to read Psalm 32 for further information on that. The Psalms are great for building our hope. And as you know, in the bulletin, there are listed there some. And these are ones that I personally use in my time before the Lord. And I will read them aloud unto the Lord. Psalm 61, 62, 86, 93, 138, and 139. And I wish to read the rest of 139 this morning to help us find more hope in Christ this day. Beginning at verse 1 in Psalm 139, O Lord, you have examined my heart to know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel, when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. You go before me and follow me. You place your hand of blessing on my head. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too great for me to understand. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me. Your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night, but even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body, knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. And when I wake up, you are still with me. Search me, O oh God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything in me that offends you and lead me along the past of everlasting life. Amen. The word amen means, may it be so. But at the same time, hope should bring forth an exclamation of praise, of rejoicing. And true praise is an expression of the thanks to God for what he has done and who he is. The word hallelujah is defined as an exclamation of praise. Exclaim means to cry out, to shout about who God is and what God has done. Praise has different levels of expression. There's basic approval, loud meaning great approval, acclaim an outward show of strong approval with applause and cheering, to extol, exalted with lofty praise, to eulogize, reading aloud a speech, such as reading a psalm unto God. But it all comes forth from the heart. Matthew 15, 18 declares, what proceeds from our lips comes from the abundance of our heart. That which proceeds from my mouth reflects the nature of my heart. Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 describe the heart of man. It says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. But then the Lord says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. 
Remember Psalm 139, God sees all, he knows all. God longs after each heart to restore and reunite it with God the Father. And that can only occur through Jesus, his son. Our relationship with God is expressed through the heart. And the heart in scripture is described by just three possible levels of passion towards God. Matthew 24, verse 12 declares, because lawlessness increased, most people's love or hearts will grow cold. Another translation say they will be wax cold. You know, what's happening around us today, brothers and sisters, do not let your heart grow cold toward being in the presence of God, seeking God, reading his word, and coming before him with all your heart, soul, and mind as often as you can, as frequently as you can. Do not drift away during this time. Revelation 3.16, the church of Laodicea, says you're neither hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. And it says the Lord will spew you out of his mouth. It makes God sick. Those that have one foot in the kingdom, one foot out. One way in the church, another way when they're out of the world. And then there's Luke 24, 32, talking about how we should be in the presence of God and hearing of God's word and our desire for God. Were not our hearts burning within us when he was speaking to us on the road while he explained the scriptures to us? Our hearts burning on fire for Jesus. Our expression, our exclamation, our shout or cry to God, our hallelujah reflects our passion for God. It's not a performance. It's not humanly conjured up. It's not something that a cheerleader comes up here and we follow the cheer. Let me tell you what, the Holy Spirit, when it moves, draws its attention to only one. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Not any man. That's how you tell if the Holy Spirit is moving. It is rather a sincere, spontaneous expression of your spiritual and physical relationship with God. Our hallelujahs are a thermostat, a thermometer of our passion, our love, our worship, our obedience, and our desire to follow him. Psalm 20, verse five declares, we will sing for joy over your victory and in the name of our God, that's the very name the world hates. We will set our banners. When God's love overcomes our love of sin, then we can turn to God for forgiveness and grace, changing our hate from human hatred for God to the righteous hatred of those things that God hates, developing our hope and trust in Jesus and him alone. Only when we surrender all to him can I rejoice in the good times and the bad and the happy and the sad because my faith is firmly anchored upon the solid rock, Jesus Christ, with the promise of his word and his spirit in my heart that he'll never leave me nor forsake me. I will never stand alone again. By hating what God hates, the way God hates it, it builds our hope that God's will in everything, in everything, my brothers and sisters, will be done. And in that, no matter what comes our way, we can rejoice and say, hallelujah, glory to God in the highest. He reigns on high, and in him I will place my trust. Psalm 138, verse one and two reads, I give, my, I give you thanks, O Lord, with all my heart, I will sing your praises before the gods. I bow before your holy temple as I worship. I praise your name with your unfailing love and faithfulness, for your promises are backed by all the honor of your name. I'm going to let you finish the rest of Psalm 138. I challenge you to read it this afternoon and pray that the Holy Spirit will make it come alive and real to you. Hate, hope, and hallelujah. I sense a whole lot more love in this place than when we began, and that's because the truth has been heard, accepted and received, and believed. And that truth, my friends, that truth will set each of us free to do God's will. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you and we praise you for the word this morning. And Father God, we just pray that in our hearts and lives, Lord, you will cause this word to take root and to sprout up. That, Father, we'll desire to go deeper into an understanding of how a righteous hatred that you have, God, should be part of us and come forth in the love 
that we have received from you. Father God, teach us more of what we need to know to make it through these difficult times. And first and foremost, Father God, help us to be in a right relationship with you. That right relationship requires us coming before you each and every day, Lord, to ask again, as David said, wash me of my iniquities, cleanse me of my sin, make me conscious of my transgression, for the sin lies in my mind. Create in me, O Lord, a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, and Lord, Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Our desire upon our knees, Father, as we cry out to you to save those, Lord Jesus, that we love, but also to save those that hate of this world may creep into our hearts and lives. Those that we see, Father, that are in sin, those that are doing wrong, making wrong choices, Father God, who spew from their lips evil thoughts. For we know that your word declares that your judgment will fall one day. And Lord, we wish that none, as you wish, that none would perish, that all would come to know your mercy, your grace, and your love, and your forgiveness. Oh, Father God, if there be anybody here this morning who has never opened their heart, and there may be strangers, but there also may be people amongst us here who have never truly opened their heart to Jesus Christ and said, Jesus, I surrender it all because as long as you hold on to but one fetter one chain of the old man the old nature know that the enemy has got a foothold in the door of your heart and it doesn't take much for him to pry it open shut the door on him right now if you've never accepted Christ into your heart and you want to accept Jesus into your heart fully and completely just say Lord come into my heart forgive me of the sins I surrender all to you, Lord. Make me a child of the King. Fill me with the Holy Spirit and lead me according to thy will and purpose. And Father God, we know that your spirit enters in. Your word declares it. And we're made anew, anew in Christ, a new child of God. And Father God, may we go forward with the burning, the burning desire in our heart, Father God, that can only be placed there by the Holy Spirit and desiring more of you and less of me. Help to keep our focus upon you and running this race of this world. Help us to keep our eyes upon you. Help us to come to you with all of our needs. And we'll give you the glory, the honor, the praise. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen.